No, I think it just sounds. I'd like to thank the organizers and Kathy for the invitation to give this talk here. It's actually my second time in this campus about four or five years ago. There was a nanotechnology, food nanotechnology conference here, which I took part in. So it's good to come here again. Uh, so, again, my name is Yoav Ligny, I'm from the Biotechnology and Food Engineering Department at the Technion, and um, I work on physical chemistry of biopolymers in food, and particularly in development of various nano-delivery systems for health-promoting compounds. And today I'll talk about invisible health promoters. Uh, so as you all know, it, it, we've been talking about it this morning, the, the world is suffering from various uh, big issues of non-communicable diseases like obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, obesity uh, and uh, diabetes and uh, cardiovascular diseases. And uh, of course, there is also the issue of cancer, which is uh, not going anywhere in the near future. Uh, and so uh, there is a great need for, for improving health in various ways. And, and Personally, I'm much more a strong believer in prevention than in, 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 in curing. Um, but uh, so for my, my motivation, again, is uh, to really uh, enrich foods and beverages. And, and I, I fully subscribe to Dr. Winkler's uh, approach that we should enrich the, the staple foods and beverages without having people need to change their habits. So, uh, radically, uh, but just make the foods they eat more healthy and do that without modifying too much the sensory uh, properties, maybe improve them, but certainly not make them any worse. So uh, we want to produce uh, protect, protective nature-inspired uh, uh, carriers for, for enrichment of food and beverages with nutraceuticals. And uh, as you all know, nutraceuticals are all those uh, uh, health promoting mi micro ingredients uh, like vitamins, antioxidants, omega 3 fatty acids, uh, which, are, which have the growing body of evidence that they are, help they are helping to promote uh, health. And uh, I roughly uh, divide them in two groups the water soluble and the oil soluble. Uh, most of our studies were focusing on the oil soluble ones, but there's one study I'll show you which also worked on EDCG, which is more. Or water soluble. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, we, if we want to uh, enrich foods, uh, there are several uh, several uh, important uh, problems. Uh, um, I'll come back to vitamin D in a second. Uh, several important problems, uh, particularly the the hydrophobic compounds. Uh, they are not water soluble if we want to enrich beverages, particularly clear beverages. Uh, we have problems of, of stability because of solubility. We have problems of turbidity. And uh, there are some off flavors problems. And um, of course, there is the, the issue of, uh, resi of uh, stability during uh, processing, shelf life, and, and digestion. So we have to overcome all these problems and protect those those very sensitive compounds against deterioration. And, but we shouldn't protect them too much because then they would not be bioavailable. We want them to still be, be absorbed and, and do their job. So they need to be bioavailable. We want to keep the, the we want to try to use uh, natural ingredients only, mainly food ingredients. So we keep a label friendliness, uh, a label friendly product. And uh, we have to know that while not decreasing the cost significantly, because otherwise it's not going to be economically viable. So it's a lot of challenges, and, and so we're, we, we have to find a creative solution to do all that. So I'll, I'll briefly describe several technologies we've been developing for this uh, uh, task over the last few years uh, for enriching mainly clear beverages uh, with nutraceuticals. So the first one, is based on uh, complexes of beta-lactoglobulin, a whey protein, and pectin. <coughs> and beta-lactoglobulin, as many of you probably know, it's a, it's a whey protein. It has this barrel, beta barrel shape with a little uh, uh, internal hydrophobic cavity, which is a good place to find hydrophobic compounds. And there's 
couple more potential binding sites. Uh, and the pectin, which is uh, from citrus or from apple, uh, it's an anionic polysaccharide. Uh, and since it's anionic, uh, about, about, about pH 2 or so, it's more and more uh, uh, negatively charged. And uh, beta-lactoglobulin is ha has an uh, isoelectric pH around 5. So below its isoelectric uh, pH, it is positively charged. So if we take that range in between the, the pKa of the polyanionic pectin and the pI of the protein, they're oppositely charged. So they spontaneously form complexes in solution. However, uh, if, we, if, if we just let them uh, neutralize each other, they, they, comp they form complexes which then coacerbate and precipitate. So it's not very useful for our purposes. However, if we, if we, uh, if we add excess of pectin, and look at these series of files. This is just beta-lactoglobulin. In all of them, it's the same concentration of beta-lactoglobulin. But then we start increasing the concentration of pectin. Initially, we get more and more coacervation and precipitation. But above, beyond a certain point, suddenly we get a stable colloidal system, uh, which is almost completely transparent. And if we look at the zeta potential, which is the measure of the charge of the nanoparticles, we see that just the protein at pH about four, four, four and a half is positively charged. When we start adding pectin, we reduce the charge. At this area, we get complete charge neutralization, so the system is completely uh, unstable and precipitates. But when we keep adding pectin, again, we get negative, uh, negative charge from the particles, and so they repel each other and we get good, st good colloidal stability. Uh, in terms of turbidity, you can see that also uh, when you increase the pectin, you get more and more turbidity. You keep increasing it, suddenly again, it becomes clear. And on the molecular level, what actually is happening is that here you have just the protein, you add a little bit of pectin, they neutralize each other, you get huge complexes which precipitate, but if you add more pectin, you get those nanoparticles which have excess of pectin, they're both uh, repelling each other because of negative charge and because of the electrostatic, uh, because of steric uh, repulsion. So uh, then we, we wanted to use this idea to nano encapsulate uh, hydrophobic compounds. So we use uh, DHA, the phosphohexanoic acid from fish oil, and this shows the binding by fluorescence. It binds to the protein quite well, and uh, then we add pectin again the same way we add pectin until we have excess of pectin and we get complete, completely clear uh, solutions. What is more interesting is in terms of, of protection, this is just the DHA in water, it degrades quite quickly. If we just add the beta-lactoglobulin, it binds it, it gives very little bit of protection, but when we also add the pectin, this is a stress test, 100 hours, at 40 degrees C, almost no loss, maybe 10% loss of the DHA. So we get a nice uh, protection. Another project where we tried to tackle a, a, a water-soluble compound, which is uh, EGCG, uh, from uh, green tea. As you know, green tea is one of the uh, tea in general is a very popular drink. But green tea in particular has those family of uh, polyphenolic uh, compounds, catechins, uh, which have many, many good uh, health benefits, like against cardiovascular diseases neurodegenerative degenerative diseases, obesity, cancer, and so on. However, the, the green tea catechins uh, have several sensitivity issues. They are very sensitive to degradation and oxidation, and in, especially in neutral and, and alkaline pHs, they quickly uh, oxidize, polymerize, and form this yellowish, brownish color. And they're also bitter and astringent, so we have a, a sensory issue. This is what happens to uh, EGCG in, in a buffer solution with time. It just builds on yellowish, brownish color and just becomes less and less uh, uh, effective. And so we developed this process where we take beta-lactoglobulin again at neutral pH. We just heat it for like 20 minutes, 70 degrees C. And we take the EGCG, we dissolve it in acidic solution, and then uh, we mix them with high steering and cool it down. And uh, as you can see, this is just the just the whey protein, just the beta-lactoglobulin, uh, particle size, 
uh, we see mainly the monomeric, dimeric species here, and a little bit of aggregates due to the heat treatment. But when we keep, when we start adding uh, EPCG, higher and higher concentrations, up to one, to ten to one, uh, we see slight. We first of all we see disappearance of the monomeric species, so we get just complexes. But the complexes, even at the ten to one ratio, they are below forty nanometers. So basically, the solution remains completely clear. Uh, what is more interesting is the protection. This is just EGCG in, in water, in buffer. It just becomes more and more brown and oxidized with time. Just with the native protein, there's some protection, but with the heat denatured protein, there's much, much better protection. And as, as you can see, this is protected and non -protected. Also, in terms of sensory, we've done a taste panel by an objective company, and they taste the bitterness and astringency in, in, in all parameters. There was significant uh, improvement in terms of both bitterness and astringency. Another project uh, where we again try to encapsulate uh, hydrophobic compounds, uh, we used the Maillard reaction uh, to form new block of polymeric uh, molecules uh, to encapsulate uh, hydrophobic compounds. So the approach is as follows. As you know, Maillard reaction it is a, by heating a protein and a polysaccharide, they conjugate, they form a covalent linkage, and so we get this uh, block of polymer, which then can, in, in, in water, can self-assemble and form uh, micellar structures. Now, if we add a hydrophobic molecule, uh, it would spontaneously be entrapped, and there, therefore we would have also a double-layer coating for that. So. Um, Miller reaction, as you probably know, is a very uh, complex reaction. It starts between a protein or a mean with an amine group and a sugar with an aldehyde group. If you heat them, they form a shift base. And you let them, you heat more, it, uh, with time it becomes more and more complicated until eventually you have those brown melanoidine compounds. But if you do it under a controlled condition, mild condition, you can basically stop the reaction relatively early on before you get all the brown compounds. So to do that, we use the uh, casein as the hydrophobic uh, protein, and we use maltodextrin as the more uh, as the hydrophilic uh, sugar part. And the nice thing about it is it only has uh, one aldehyde per molecule, so it can only bind to one protein molecule. Another thing we wanted to achieve, you might say, why do you need to do that? Casein by itself is already amphiphilic, right? So why do you need to connect another hydrophilic part? So uh, the, the reason is that if you think about casein, the hydrophobic part and the hydrophilic part are about the same size. So if you trap a hydrophobic, uh, like a lipophilic uh, uh, like a lipid, uh, the packing parameter of the protein is, is, not, is relatively high. And so the curvature is not high enough and the particles are big. However, if we conjugate a hydrophilic molecule onto the hydrophilic part of the protein, we make it more bulky. And so when it's self-assembled, it has the steric constraint, and it causes the packing parameter to be lower, the curvature to be higher, and the particle size to be lower. So we achieve both smaller particles and a bilayer or double layer thickness uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, coating simultaneously, which is not uh, trivial. Uh, so, this is some results. Here we use the SDS page to see if we managed to conjugate the, the protein and the, the maltodextrin. This is just the protein. Uh, of course, this is Kumasi staining, so you only see the protein. You don't see the maltodextrin here. But this is just the casein. The heated casein. This is uh, a casein which was uh, heated separately and maltodextrin. Each was heated separately, and then they were mixed. So these two lanes are the mixture of in the separately uh, heated. And the next four lanes are protein and maltodextrin, which were first mixed and then heated together. So you see there is an upward shift of about five kilodalton. And since we use a, a one kilodalton uh, maltodextrin, that means that we have about five molecules of maltodextrin bound per molecule of casein. So uh, then we try to entrap vitamin D. And here you see uh, vitamin D, which uh, we entrapped with those nanoparticles at three different pHs, including the isoelectric pH of casein, and it is still soluble and forms very small nanoparticles at the isoelectric pH. 
now when we try to increase the ratio of vitamin D to protein, uh, notice that like on the left those are the conjugates and on the right those are the mixture of individually uh, heated and then mixed protein and maltodextrin. And with the conjugates up to 8 to 1 vitamin D to protein, about 80%, more than 80% of the nanoparticles are below 100 nanometers. And with the separately heated, already above one to one, we start getting large nanoparticles. So this concept of, of curvature effect is actually working. And I think it's easier to see it visually. First of all, you see this is just a conjugate solution. You see it first thing you see, it's not brown. That means we stop the reaction early on before it started browning. And on these two, in these two vials, there is the same concentration of vitamin D, relatively high concentration. And on the right here, you see it's just in buffer, it's very turbid, but in the solution of the conjugates, it's almost completely clear. What is even more interesting is the protection that we get against degradation of the vitamin. Vitamin D is very acid sensitive, so when we simulate gastric condition two hours at pH 2.5, uh, vitamin D by itself degrades, uh, we lose about 70% of it. The mixture gives some protection thanks to the protein, uh, but the conjugates practically keep 90% of the vitamin intact. Also during shelf life, this is just vitamin after two weeks in uh, pH uh, 7, 4 degrees C. We lose about 70% of the vitamin. The mixture gives some protection and the conjugates practically no loss in two weeks. Uh, due to shortage, shortage in time, I'll skip this project. We've done a similar thing with so with soy beta in, uh, but I will not spend too much time on it. As protection, and it's okay, I'll just skip it all. Uh, okay, the, the next, uh, briefly, three more projects. Uh, one of them is uh, hydrophobins from, uh, from fungi. There are, you can, there are uh, very interesting proteins called hydrophobins, which are found in, in mushrooms, uh, also in edible mushrooms. And these proteins are small, about 9, 10 kilodaltons, and they have a very, very uh, hydrophobic patch and hydrophilic uh, part. And they, they can form, they can absorb to uh, hydrophobic surfaces, make them hydrophilic, and, and vice versa. And so uh, here we looked at the self-assembly of of hydrophobins and solutions using pyrene, which changes its fluorescence when it's found in hydrophobic domains. And you can see it self-assembles. We can calculate this, the critical micelle concentration from that. And we also looked at binding of two hydrophobic molecules, like vitamin D and the nile red, which is just a hydrophobic probe. In both cases, we get nice binding constant 10 to the power of 5. And also in terms of particle size, you can see vitamin D by itself forms relatively large particles, but in, in the protein by itself forms small, small particles. And when it entraps the vitamin, it, it only slightly grows in size, but we still have particles which are relatively small. You can visually again see the vitamin D test. This is just vitamin D, and this is vitamin D in presence of hydrophobin clear solution. You can see it under a microscope. This is vitamin D in, in water. It forms uh, aggregates which are uh, actually crystalline. And this is in the presence of, of uh, the hydrophobin. Practically, you don't see anything. We go to higher magnification using electron microscopy, cryo-electron microscopy. You can see that the hydrophobin forms ag form aggregates, uh, uh, irregular ones. But in the presence of vitamin D, suddenly we see those beautiful flat-shaped, self-assembled uh, 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 nanoparticles uh, with relatively thick rings. And uh, what we think is actually happening is that vitamin D absorbs to the hydrophobic patches of the proteins, and the proteins form like sandwiches and form like flat layers, uh, sandwich, like the vitamin is sandwiched between two hydrophobic layers. And the reason why the rim is thick is like a, when you fold the carpet, you know there is this effect of thickness on the, on the because of the curvature. <coughs> so that's, that's the, the structure that we get. And recently we've seen that with other uh, hydrophobic compounds with hydrophobins together. So it's not specific to vitamin D, but a combination of hydrophobins 
with the hydrophobic compound forms those nice structures. Uh, it also protects the, the vitamin during shelf life, for example. This is unprotected and with the hydrophobins. So that's the whole story in one slide. And uh, <coughs> lastly, a couple of very brief projects. Uh, now we're focusing on plant-based uh, materials uh, due to several reasons. One is the issue of, uh, as at least in, in Israel, the Jewish people, they, they want uh, you know, non-dairy uh, drinks because if you drink it after a, meat, a, me a meal with meat, you can't have a dairy uh, a beverage. And especially if it's a clear beverage, you would not expect there would be milk components in there. So there is also a, a problem of allergenicity, which is worldwide. Uh, problem, so we, we're looking for non-allergenic plant-based uh, materials. And so this is a very interesting protein uh, from a plant source, of a very common food plant. I cannot tell you right now which it is because it's still under IP protection, but basically this is a very common plant and uh, plant protein. And as you can see with vitamin D, again, this plant protein provides this effect of clar clarification by encapsulating is preventing the growth of the aggregates of the vitamin D, preventing crystallization of the vitamin. And also, uh, this is also vitamin D in le lemon lime soda and in water and so on. And this is omega-3 uh, DHA, uh, where we added the also Nile Red as a colorant, as a dye to color the, the oil phase. And so here you can see uh, oil, red oil floating on the surface and absorbed to the glass. But here with the protein, this is without the protein, and this is with the protein, you see it's uh, very uniformly dispersed throughout the, the solution. Also in terms of protection, uh, this is uh, 72 degrees at pH 2.5, where the vitamin D is very sensitive. And without any protection, it degrades quickly. And with the plant protein, it, it remains intact. Also during shelf life, 25 degree, vitamin D, uh, pH 2.5 quickly degrades with the protein much, much slower. And lastly, this uh, is a plant polysaccharide, which has a fraction of the protein covalently attached. So it's naturally a block of polymer which self-assembles. As you can see that here, we use pyrene to see the CFC to see the self-assembly of, of this polysaccharide. And here it binds curcumin, another very interesting nutraceutical compound. Uh, so it shows very nice binding uh, for the curcumin and protection of the curcumin during uh, uh, shelf life. And this is unprotected, and this is the encapsulated curcumin. So overall, uh, these technologies can uh, have various uh, advantages. We use only natural ingredients. We can keep the solutions clear. Solubilize oil soluble nutraceuticals in water. We can uh, minimize off flavors and, and undesired sensory effects. Um, enhance bioavailability. I haven't talked about that, but we have several studies which we've done over the last few years with casein micelles, which are another vehicle I haven't talked about now because it's not for clear application, clear beverage application, but we have uh, very good bioavailability results with with casein micelles. Um, we increase the uh, shelf life of the, of the nutraceutical. Uh, we can have kosher power for plant-based uh, application uh, materials. It could also be used for vegetarian or vegan uh, food. And with the last couple of uh, examples, we can also have non-allergenic uh, plant-based protein and polysaccharide application. So uh, this is my group and uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be glad to answer uh, any questions you, you may have. A very general one, going back to what you said right at the start about putting more nutraceuticals into food. Uh, do you think it's a consideration we should be careful of in not turning food into medicine? And building a little bit about what Jack said of taking the quiet approach. Exactly. I, I strongly agree with the quiet approach. I think this is a way to, to quietly introduce uh, uh, 
nutraceuticals within beverages. Beverages are relatively consumed in large amounts, and so if we make them a, a vehicle for, a, for a delivering health-promoting compounds to prevent diseases, not, I'm not saying we, we aim to cure diseases, Although some of these compounds can also improve the uh, situation when people are already sick, but the main focus is really on preventative nutrition, and, uh, and so I think this is this is a way to introduce more healthy ingredients into widely consumed beverages and foods in general. So I hope that answers your question. You did touch upon the bioavailability and uh, did not elaborate on that and presumably bioavailability goes up and if so, uh, have you considered safety aspects, for example, some of these uh, nutraceuticals, if, they, if the bioavailability is high, they can have devastating effects, for example, uh, uh, green tea catechins in high doses and uh, there are already loss of reports of liver damage and acute liver failure in some cases. Okay, it's an excellent question. So the, the, main, uh, the main question now is what happens to the bioavailability of these compounds when we now encapsulate them within proteins or maybe even polysaccharides? And uh, this is definitely something we're, we're looking into now. Now we have a, a, a rat study going on to look at uh, what the uh, encapsulation of EGCG within within beta-lactic globulin, what it does to the bioavailability of EGCG. And EGCG has a very low bioavailability. So if we can improve it, increase it, uh, even by 10, 20%, I believe it would, it would improve its uh, efficacy. Of course, we have, one of the main things we have to do is to make sure that we do not in, uh, increase uh, toxicity. So the next stage in, in making those technologies uh, or introducing these technologies into the market, before we can do that, we have to carefully do all the toxicology and look in vivo to make sure there are no adverse effects. And um, of course, if we enhance bioavailability of even vitamin D or any other uh, uh, compound, Perhaps we would need to check whether the, the absorbed levels are not are non-toxic, and perhaps the currently uh, acceptable recommended daily allowance uh, would need to be revisited. You know, if they were based on low, poorly bioavailable crystalline material, and now we form nanoparticles which are much more available. Perhaps we need to. Uh, uh, reduce the, the dosage to get the same effect. But if it's all done in a prudent way, I think overall the, the, the benefit uh, for, for health for all of us would be, would be uh, eventually obtained. Which forms of the vitamin D have you looked at? Do you get enhanced ability across the different isomers? Uh, in the beginning, we looked at vitamin D2. Uh, but later on, with the clinical trials, we only use vitamin D3. When we started developing the technology, we, we used D3, but all of the clinical trials, we've done already three clinical trials with uh, vitamin D encapsulated in casein in mice cells, and all of them with, vit with vitamin D3. And um, we found that the bioavailability is as high as when the vitamin is in, dissolved in fat, uh, at least statistically, in fat is slightly, slightly better absorbed than in particles, but not statistically significant. So basically, it's quite uh, well. The bioavailability is, is practically as good as, as when it's in, in fat. You were looking at the 25 hydroxy. We were looking at yeah 25 hydroxy uh, uh, vitamin D uh, 25 OHD uh, because that's the level that is uh, the status indicator in the blood. That's what physicians measure. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.